War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy Translated by Almer and Louise Maud Book One, Chapter Four Read for LibriVox by Nomenphile Just then, another visitor entered the drawing-room. Prince Andrew Bolkonsky, the little princess's husband. He was a very handsome young man, of medium height, with firm, clear-cut features. Everything about him, from his weary, bored expression, to his quiet, measured step, offered the most striking contrast to his little wife. It was evident that he not only knew every one in the drawing-room, but had found them to be so tiresome that it wearied him to look at or listen to them. And among all these faces that he found so tedious, none seemed to bore him so much as that of his pretty wife. He turned away from her with a grimace that distorted his handsome face, kissed Anna Pavlovna's hand, and screwing up his eyes, scanned the whole company. "'You are off to the war, Prince?' said Anna Pavlovna. "'General Kutuzov,' said Bolkonsky, speaking French and stressing the last syllable of the general's name like a Frenchman, "'has been pleased to take me as his aide-de-camp.' "'And Lisa, your wife? "'She will go to the country. "'Are you not ashamed to deprive us of your charming wife?' "'André!' said his wife, addressing her husband in the same coquettish manner in which she spoke to other men. "'The vicomte has been telling us such a tale about Mademoiselle Georges and Bonaparte.' Prince Andrew screwed up his eyes and turned away. Pierre, who from the moment Prince Andrew had entered the room, had watched him with glad, affectionate eyes, now came up and took his arm. Before he looked round, Prince Andrew frowned again, expressing his annoyance with whoever was touching his arm. But when he saw Pierre's beaming face, he gave him an unexpectedly kind and pleasant smile. "'There now, so you too are in the great world,' he said to Pierre. "'I knew you would be here,' replied Pierre. "'I will come to supper with you, may I?' he added in a low voice, so as not to disturb the vicomte, who was continuing his story. "'No, impossible.' said Prince Andrew, laughing and pressing Pierre's hand, to show that there was no need to ask the question. He wished to say something more, but at that moment Prince Vasily and his daughter got up to go, and the two young men rose to let them pass. "'You must excuse me, my dear Vicomte,' said Prince Vasily to the Frenchman, holding him down by the sleeve in a friendly way to prevent his rising. "'This unfortunate fete at the ambassadors deprives me of a pleasure and obliges me to interrupt you.' "'I'm very sorry to leave your charming party,' he said to Anna Pavlovna. His daughter, Princess Helene, passed between the chairs, lightly holding up the folds of her dress, and the smile shone still more radiantly on her beautiful face. Pierre gazed at her with rapturous, almost frightened eyes as she passed him. "'Very lovely,' said Prince Andrew. "'Very,' said Pierre. In passing, Prince Vasily seized Pierre's hand and said to Anna Pavlovna, "'Educate this bear for me. "'He has been staying with me for a whole month, "'and this is the first time I have seen him in society. "'Nothing is so necessary for a young man "'as the society of clever women.' "'Anna Pavlovna smiled and promised to take Pierre in hand. "'She knew his father to be a connection of Prince Vasily's. "'The elderly lady, who had been sitting with the old aunt, "'rose hurriedly and overtook Prince Vasily in the anteroom. All the affectation of interest she had assumed had left her kindly and tear-worn face, and it now expressed only anxiety and fear. "'How about my son Boris, Prince?' she said, hurrying after him into the anteroom. "'I can't remain any longer in Petersburg. Tell me what news I may take back to my poor boy.' Although Prince Vasily listened reluctantly, and not very politely to the elderly lady, even betraying some impatience, she gave him an ingratiating and appealing smile, and took his hand that he might not go away. "'What would it cost you to say a word to the Emperor? And then he would be transferred to the guards at once,' she said. "'Believe me, Princess, I am ready to do all I can,' answered Prince Vasily. "'But it's difficult for me to ask the Emperor. I would advise you to appeal to Rumyantsev through Prince Golitsyn. That would be the best way.' The elderly lady was Princess Drubetskaya, belonging to one of the best families in Russia, but she was poor and, having long been out of society, 
had lost her former influential connections. She had now come to Petersburg to procure an appointment in the guards for her only son. It was, in fact, solely to meet Prince Vasily that she had obtained an invitation to Anna Pavlovna's reception, and had sat listening to the vicomte's story. Prince Vasily's words frightened her. An embittered look clouded her once handsome face, but only for a moment. Then she smiled again, and clutched Prince Vasily's arm more tightly. "'Listen to me, Prince,' she said. "'I have never asked you for anything, and I never will again. Nor have I ever reminded you of my father's friendship for you. But now I entreat you, for God's sake, do this for my son, and I shall always regard you as a benefactor.' She added hurriedly, "'No, do not be angry, but promise. I have asked Golitsyn, and he has refused. Be the kind-hearted man you always were,' she said." trying to smile through the tears that were in her eyes. "'Papa, we shall be late,' said Princess Helene, turning her beautiful head and looking over her classically moulded shoulder as she stood waiting by the door. Influence in society, however, is a capital which has to be economized if it is to last. Prince Vasily knew this, and, having once realized that if he asked on behalf of all who begged him, he would soon be unable to ask for himself— he became wary of using his influence. But in Princess Trubetskaya's case, he felt, after her second appeal, something like qualms of conscience. She had reminded him of what was quite true. He had been indebted to her father for the first steps of his career. Moreover, he could see by her manners that she was one of those women, mostly mothers, who, having once made up their minds, will not rest until they have gained their end, and are prepared, if necessary, to go on insisting day after day, and hour after hour, and even to make scenes. This last consideration moved him. "'My dear Anna Mikhailovna,' he said, with his usual familiarity and weariness of tone, "'it is almost impossible for me to do what you ask, but to prove my devotion to you, and how I respect your father's memory, I will do the impossible. Your son shall be transferred to the guards. Here is my hand on it. Are you satisfied?' "'My dear benefactor, this is what I expected from you. I knew your kindness.' He turned to go. "'Wait, just a word. When he has been transferred to the guards,' she faltered, "'you are on good terms with Mikhail Ilarionovich Kutuzov. Recommend Boris to him as an adjutant. Then I shall be at rest, and then—' Prince Vasily smiled. "'No, I won't promise that. You don't know how Kutuzov is pressed since his appointment as commander-in-chief.' He told me himself that all the Moscow ladies have conspired to give him their sons as adjutants. "'No, but promise I won't let you go, my dear benefactor.' "'Papa,' said his beautiful daughter, in the same tone as before, "'we shall be late.' "'Well, au revoir, good-bye. You hear her.' "'Then tomorrow you will speak to the Emperor?' "'Certainly, but about Kutuzov I don't promise.' "'Do promise, do promise, Vasily,' cried Anna Mihailovna as he went, with a smile of a coquettish girl, which at one time probably came naturally to her, but was now very ill-suited to her careworn face. Apparently she had forgotten her age, and by force of habit employed all the old feminine arts. But as soon as the prince had gone, her face resumed its former cold, artificial expression. She returned to the group, where the vicomte was still talking, and again pretended to listen, while waiting till it would be time to leave. Her task was accomplished. End of chapter 4